morning. Good morning. Welcome. Let us honor Jesus who gave his life for us. May we worship him in spirit and in truth. The key verse for today is John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Let us rise and sing with our hearts. Number four, glorify the name. <clears throat> at the cross. Thank you. 
prayer by Greg Croft. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praise and thank God for loving us, conquering sin, death, and Satan by going to the cross for us and giving us life by rising from the dead. Thank you for giving us life and helping us believe through the more than conquers Easter Bible Conference. Thank you for Pastor James and Abigail for all their hard work for your glory and our blessing. Blessed it from beginning to end with Bible studies, powerful messages, um, inspiring testimonies, Bible recitals, music programs and servants, and fine fellowship and food. Thank God for Jenny's baptism into Jesus, death and resurrection into God's kingdom. Enable her to make unashamed confession of faith and hope in Jesus. We thank God for helping Mary, the disciples, and each of us when we don't understand how God is working. God works to turn grief into joy for all who cling to Jesus and his word. I can see the joy in the faces of all in the group a photo afterward. Each of us may listen to the voice of the risen Jesus, set aside our own idea, and be willing like Mary, to own the mission Jesus gives each of us. We ask your guiding spirit on Pastor Ron Ward as he directs you be up, so every campus may be evangelized with the gospel. Leaders who love and follow God's word may be raised up in this generation. We pray for our, our country, our states, and our local communities to return to biblical values. We pray any strongholds of Satan in our country will be overthrown, that Jesus came to overthrow the works of Satan. Bless all preparations for the European Summer uh, Bible Conference, The Way, which is held August 1st to the 4th, 2024. Let truth, peace, and hope in the gospel reach all people throughout the world, especially in places of war, chaos, and suffering right now. People in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, North Korea, and Haiti. Raise up leaders and statesmen that do God's will, even if they don't intend to, but raise up leaders who desire to do God's will. Bless the Vax and Quans in Madison to have a fruitful uh, disciple-making ministry. Give missionaries Abraham and Joanne good health to serve God's mission in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank God for giving Hezekiah a suitable job and bless him and Jim Book in a new life together. Grant suitable work for David, Peter Curry, Hans, and myself, and thank God for giving Peter a good interview. Bless him and others' marriage preparations and give her a safe arrival this Friday. Restore little, little Helen to good health as she is a little sick right now. Bless our group Bible studies leaders and help each of us to, who attend to grow in a relationship to God and each other. We may serve as one to one Bible study leaders and be and make disciples of Jesus. Help each family to be Christ centered and bless our church to be one in Christ and love God and each other. Bless today's service with your word and Holy Spirit to be with Hezekiah as he presides. Bless the music servants and Ruth and the senior women as they will sing special song. Empower Pastor Paul with your Holy Spirit as he gives the message today, Jesus, a kernel of wheat, and open our hearts and ears to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture reading will be John 12, 20 to 50. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the ones who serve me. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus. 
Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The crowd spoke up. We have heard that the law, that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn. And I would heal them. <laughs> Yet at the same time, many, among, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly, openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. <laughs> Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Right. Uh, now we'll have a special hymn. Senior woman.
Now we'll have the message. Jesus, a kernel of wheat, by Pastor Paul. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I thank you for a wonderful, special song by Vicky and Naomi. So thank you for beautiful weather. Eh? Spring has come, it was beautiful weather. So thank you for the wonderful conference we had last week. So thank you for each of you who came to hear God's word and worship God in spirit and the truth. The title for today's message is Jesus, a kind of a wheat. So what is the title? Jesus, Jesus a kind of a wheat. That's really key verse 24. Together, but truly I tell you, unless a kind of a wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, produces many seeds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Jesus who came to save us from our sins. He died on the cross, shed his precious blood, and rose again from the dead. And he opened the way for us to receive forgiveness from all our sins and freedom from the power of Satan and give us eternal life and the kingdom of God. Today we came here to hear your word from John chapter 12, uh, 20 through 50. Uh, Jesus, a kind of a wit. Please anoint me, the Holy Spirit use me as your servant. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, this passage is a conclusion of Jesus' public ministry. Jesus had proclaimed in many ways that he is the Messiah. Finally, he entered Jerusalem as a humble Savior King, riding on a donkey's court in fulfillment of a scripture. People expect Jesus to go to the palace, proclaim revolution, and bring about immediate political, social, economic revolution. Instead, Jesus predicted his suffering and death and explained his meaning by an analogy of a kernel of wheat. Most people did not understand what Jesus was talking about. Though Jesus had performed many signs, people would not believe because they felt Jesus did not conform to their idea of the Messiah. In the same way, many people today have their own concept for the, of the Messiah. There is a political Messiah, economic and prosperous Messiah, and healing Messiah, and so on. While there is an element of truth in each of those concepts, they miss the main point about who the Messiah is. We need to examine our concept of the Messiah. The concept of the Messiah is a biblical, is uh, what the Bible teaches, or do we have our own idea? We need to listen to what the Bible tells us about the Messiah. Let's learn what the Bible teaches about the true Messiah and accept him in our hearts, giving up our own ideas. He will give us eternal life and enable us to bear much fruit. Part one, unless a kind of wit dies. Can we say together, please? Unless a kind of wit dies. The Jewish Passover festival was approaching. Passover is a Jewish festival celebrating the exodus from Egypt and Israelites freedom from slavery to the Egyptians. The Feast of Passover along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread was the first of the festivals to be commanded by God for Israel to observe. All Jewish men who were scattered all over the world were required to come to Jerusalem. Among them were some Greeks who had come to worship. They must have been Gentile converts to Judaism. They perceived that the God of Israel, uh, God of truth was in Israel. Somehow they had heard about Jesus. They must, they must, have, uh, they must have been amazed when they heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to know who Jesus was. It was more than mere curiosity. They wanted to solve the problem of death and find a way of eternal life. They were truth seekers. 
So they came to Philip and they requested, So, would you like to see Jesus? Philip hesitated to bring them to Jesus, perhaps because Jews did not associate with the Gentiles. So he asked Andrew's some opinion. Andrew did not hesitate. He together with Philip, brought them to Jesus right away. When Jesus called this, he replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Can we say it together, please? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Until now, Jesus had repeatedly said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But here he said, the hour has come. It meant God's set time for his death on the cross. It was God's set time for Jesus to be crucified on the cross. To die on the cross was very shameful and painful. It seemed to be a failure and defeat. But Jesus saw this as a glory and a victory. He said, my time has come. The way of the cross is the way of glory and victory. Jesus explained this in three ways. In the first place, Jesus explained his death through the analogy of the kernel of wheat. Let's read verse 24 together, please, together. But truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus foresaw abundant fruits coming forth through his death and resurrection, like a kernel of wheat that produces many seeds. The fruits would include the Greeks, like those who came to worship, who were representative of the Gentiles. Why did Jesus use the analogy of the kernel of wheat? It was to communicate the meaning of his death in a way that everyone could understand. Jesus' death was not an ordinary death. Everyone else dies because of their sins. People's death is just a terrible punishment for sin. But Jesus' death is a different. He was sinless, blameless, holy, and righteous. He did not have to die for his own sins. He died as the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. His death has a substitutionary atoning power to pay the debt that our sins, our sins deserve, your sins deserve, my sins deserve, so that we can be forgiven and accepted by God as his children. Just as a kernel of wheat dies and produces many seeds, so through the death of one man, Jesus Christ, numerous people, numerous souls have received salvation. However, if Jesus had not died for us, numerous people would not have life. Just as a kernel of wheat that remains only a single seed, does not produce any fruit. So Jesus' death is very important. Jesus' death is related to the salvation of all people, including your salvation and my salvation. Jesus used a narrative of the kernel of wheat to explain the meaning of his death in a way that all kinds of people can understand. Let's think for a minute about how a kernel of wheat can produce many seeds. A kernel of wheat has the potential to bear much fruit because there is a life in it. Life is mysterious. In the last winter, it was very cold, harsh, and freezing winter. But every seed survived, endured harsh and cold, freezing winter. They are coming back to life. They are about to sprout. So last, this, uh, last uh, uh, winter, Vicky and Naomi and then uh, Jinbo planted the tulips. You see, you saw the flowers, tulip flowers. Tulips survived hard, harsh and cold winter. Life is mysterious. By its very nature, life should grow, life should grow and reproduce the same kind of life as itself. In order to grow and reproduce, a seed must fall to the ground and die. That's the truth. 
A seed must fall to the ground and die. The seed first falls to the ground. Many universities, many universities have published studies that describe how a kernel of wheat goes into a full head of grain. Many people got, you know, they wrote down the notations and got a PhD about this. The seed first falls to the ground, composed of three parts, endosperm, bran, and germ. It begins to germinate in the soil, producing both a stalk that pushes through the soil to the surface to take in energy from the sun, and roots that push it downward to throw in water and nutrients from the soil. As the stalk grows, it divides into several parts. The plant goes through as many as 11 stages before it becomes ripened. This process takes about three or four months, or three or four months. A ripened head has about 100 to 125 new corners in it. If the harvested kernels are replanted over five growing cycles, more than 20 billion kernels will be produced. 125 times 125 times 125 times 125 times 125. This will become a 220 billion. This all comes from one kernel of a wheat which fell to the ground and died. Actually, the death of one death of the seed is a transformation into an abundant new life. Jesus' life is, is exactly like this. Jesus not only taught the principle of the corner of wheat, he practiced it. He practiced it. He died as a corner of wheat. He offered his life as a sacrifice of atonement for our sins. And God raised him from the dead. His death and resurrection became the foundation of salvation for everyone who believes. Jesus gave up all his glory as God, who is infinite, eternal, almighty, to come into this world in human flesh. He was like a seed falling to the ground. He was born in a manger, became poor in order to make us rich. He served all kinds of sinners, pouring out his life, love, and energy for their sake. He is an example of a life-giving service for people of all generations to follow. More than that, he died on the cross, shedding his precious blood to save us from sin and eternal condemnation. This is how Jesus became a conduit of wit. Praise Jesus, who became a conduit of wit for us. Amen. Can we say, praise Jesus together? Praise Jesus. In the second place, Jesus applied the principle of the kernel of wheat to everyone, to everyone, including you and me, everyone. We cannot apply this analogy about, to our lives exactly as Jesus did. Yet there is a principle at work here that Jesus applies to all people. Jesus teaches us that there is only one guaranteed way of bringing forth fruit in our lives. That is by falling into the ground and dying to self. Just as a grain of wheat dies and brings forth fruit. Let's read verse 25 together, please, together. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while every, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Sounds like a paradox, paradox isn't it? But we cannot love our lives and still expect to follow Christ. We cannot serve both God and money. Can we serve God both money and God? Can we serve God both God and money? No. If we spend our lives grasping for the things of this world, we we'll ultimately lose it oh. After pursuing all this world has to offer, in the end, we'll discover that everything was meaningless. Everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Here to love one's life means to love it more than God. Hating one's life in this world does not mean torturing oneself day and night, rather it means to deny oneself. 
and to love God wholeheartedly. That's the meaning of it. To hate one's life means to deny ourselves and love God wholeheartedly. This involves dying to self and sacrifice to do his work. It is a personal matter for each one which we refer to as God's calling. God's calling is crucial to do the work of God. Without God's calling, no one can commit to God and bear fruit. Everyone wants to bear much fruit, but many people don't like to die to self and commit to God. But Jesus said that anyone who loves their life will lose it, but anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. This is paradoxical, but it's the truth that Jesus told us. Jesus said together, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his clothes and follow me. Whoever wants to save it, his life will lose it. But whoever loses life for me and for the gospel will save it. Can we read it one more time together, please? Together, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his clothes and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses a life for me and for the gospel will save it. Many, uh, many people think that if I deny myself in this selfish world, who will take care of me? They also think that if they love their lives in this world, preserve them, and take good care of themselves, they'll be happy. But this is not true. Instead, they suffer from guilt, anxiety, fear, and in the end, they lose everything when they die. Do you remember the parable of the rich fool? In Luke chapter 12, 16 through 20, Jesus tells this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my pounds and build the bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I said to myself, you have plenty of uh, grain later for many years. Take life easy, eat and drink and be merry. He could have used his words to help other people, poor people around him. But he did not use his words to help other people. But God said to him, You fool! This very night, your life will be demanded from you. You fool! This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? What happened to this man? He could not take even one single penny to his death. He could not. The worst part is what happened to him after death. So you can say that to live for one's self is a foolish investment. We were created by God to live for the glory of God. We were saved by the grace of God to live for the glory of God to, and help other people around us, to serve other people, to worship God and serve His people. On the other hand, to lose oneself for Jesus and the gospel may seem to be foolish but it's the widest way of life. That's the best way of life, to live for Christ and his kingdom. For Christ, live for Christ and his kingdom. Can we say that together, please? Live for Christ and his kingdom. Together, live for Christ and his kingdom. It leads, to, it leads one to eternal life and to be a blessing to others, producing much fruit. Numerous people, have lived out this truth throughout history. So we need to make a decision today, right now, to live for my, for me alone, or to live for Christ and his kingdom. I pray that each of us make a decision right now to live for Christ and his kingdom for the rest of our life. Amen. Jesus does not want us, want you and me to be a kernel of wheat which remains only a single seed. He never, he does not want anyone.
to remain as a single seed. He wants each of us to be a kernel of wheat which falls to the ground and produces many seeds. As long as we live for our, our lives only for ourselves, we remain only as single seed. But if we live for Christ and his kingdom, God will make each of us a kernel of wheat which produces many seeds, like Hudson Taylor, missionary to China. Adoniram Judson, missionary to Indone uh, India and uh, uh, Burma. And Henry J. Apenzella, missionary to Korea. William B. Scranton, missionary to Korea. And Horace Underwood, missionary to Korea. And Sarah Berry, Sarah Berry, you know her, American missionary to Korea. And Dr. Sandy Lee, Korean missionary to USA. Many other people, many missionaries. The one who hates his life in this world applies to anyone who is willing to give up absolutely everything in this world, including life itself, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Such a person dedicates himself exclusively to God and his kingdom because he knows that the reward is a priceless behind all earthly value. He understands that we must go through many hardships and to enter the kingdom of God. This one has the promise of eternal life. 1983, 83, uh, it was, I think, October 1st, September, last day, Dr. Samuel Lee called me and he asked me whether you want to go to Milwaukee to serve the work of God, to support the work of God. When he called me, I showed John chapter 12, 24. I tell the truth. I tell the truth. Unless a condom of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it means only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I made a decision, commitment to God. I want to become a condom of wheat for the work of God in Milwaukee. For the rest of life, I don't know how many years I will live in this world, but I want to recommit my life to live for Christ and his kingdom as a corner of wheat. Amen. In verse 26, Jesus said, Whoever serves me must follow me. Let's read verse 26 together, please. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. This is a great promise to his servants. The reward for serving Jesus is to receive honor from God, honor from God. The reward for serving Jesus is to receive honor from God, the Father. This honor is both reward and recognition. As we follow Jesus, he's with us always. When we serve God, he does not leave us alone. When we need comfort, he comforts us. When we need encouragement, he encourages us. When we need wisdom, he supplies it. When we need strength, he gives it. He always provides for our needs. He loves us with unfailing love. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And that's not all. Those who serve Jesus will receive honor from the Father. At the end of their lives on earth, they'll be welcomed into his glorious kingdom and heal the worries. Well done, my good and faithful servant, and be adorned with a crown of righteousness. Let's read it together, please. Well done, my good and faithful servant, and be adorned with a crown of righteousness. Do you want to heal God's recognition when you get to the kingdom of God? Then let's live as a kernel of wit, which pulls the ground and dies and produces many seeds. None of the salvation's benefits are a reward for our performance. Forgiveness and heaven are uh, gifts granted to us because of God's great love. The most unworthy criminal who cries out in repentance on his deathbed received the same pardon and eternity in heaven as the missionary martyred on the mission field. However, however, Jesus does promise many different kinds of rewards in heaven for every deed done in his name on earth. Amen. When you serve other people, even with a, cold of a, a cup of cold water, God remembered you are a laborer of the Lord. 
when you serve sheep, one to one of Bible students, with the words of God, we kept awake, sacrificing the time. God remember you. God reward you. God reward you. Those who lead many people to righteousness, they will shine like the stars in heaven forever and ever. Because the world will be different for each person. Of course, we receive forgiveness, salvation together. We receive the same grace, but God's world will be different. When we walk in fellowship with him, keeping our sins confessed, and our lives free of besetting sins, we are rewarded daily with the fruit from the Holy Spirit, communion with God, power to resist the attacks of Satan. Whatever struggles we face on earth, rather to obey God's word, will be overly compensated in eternity, a words we cannot even imagine. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I thank God for each of you, but I thank God for Pastor James and Abigail who have been serving the work of God wholeheartedly. I don't know how much they are labeled, but God knows they are labeled in the Lord. God rewarded them abundantly. Amen. In the third place, Jesus explained that the impact of his death on the cross, though Jesus decided to die like a kind of witch, it was not easy for him as a human being. He expressed his agony, saying, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. This is John's version of Jesus' Gethsemane prayer. Jesus was troubled when he thought about being betrayed, tried, condemned, mocked, insulted, and crucified. More than that, he was troubled by the thought of being cut off from God on the cross because of our sins. This would make him cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As a human being, Jesus wanted to uh, pray to save himself. But in that moment, Jesus decided to obey God's will, saying, No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Can we say it together, please? Together. Father. Father, glorify your name. One more time. Father, glorify your name. Jesus remembered the purpose of his coming into the world. Hebrews 10, 7 says, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. What was the purpose of his coming? What is the will of God? Why did God send Jesus first to reveal the Father? Can we say that together, please? To reveal the Father. In the Old Testament, God began to reveal himself as the creator, lawgiver, judge, and the redeemer of his people. Then came Jesus. Jesus revealed God in a way that really caught our attention. Without Jesus, we are not able to see God. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and his closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Jesus is, in fact, the exact representation of his being. That is, if you have, if you, if you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Jesus spoke God's words, thought God's thoughts, felt and expressed God's emotions, and did God's works. God sent Jesus into the world to reveal the Father to us. Amen. Second, to do away with the sin. To do away with the sin. He came to take away our sins. Hebrews 9.26 says, He has appealed once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with the sin. To do away with the sin. Can we say it together, please? To do away with the sin. By the sacrifice of himself, 
The sacrifices of old Levitical system were insufficient, was not sufficient to take away our sin. But Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice once for all time. With the shedding of his blood on the cross, never again would animals need to die as our substitute. I think the animals were happy that they don't have to die. <laughs> mm. When God, <clears throat> with the shedding of his blood on the cross, never again would the animals need to die as our substitutes. When God sent his one and only son Jesus into the world, the Son of God took on human flesh and provided better sacrifice for sin, a better covenant with God's people. God wanted to do away with the sin once and for all in Christ. God forgave his sin and released us from his penalty. Through faith in Jesus, we have a full deliverance from guilt. Not only that, we have a deliverance from the hold of sin itself, true salvation, real peace with God. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can we say that together, please? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Third, to destroy the work of the devil. Can we say it together, please? To destroy the works of the devil. First John chapter 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy, destroy the devil's work. It was a divine mission, executed with the precision of a well-planned military strike. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God landed on a foreign soul behind enemy lines with a mission to demolish something, and he succeeded in his objective. Jesus wrecked all the devil had been doing. The devil has been working to build a kingdom for himself. But Jesus came to dissolve the framework, making everything Satan has ever done a worthless waste of time. The devil had made his sand castle, and Jesus was the tide, mighty tide. The devil's work, works that Jesus destroyed, include deception, but Jesus is the truth. Sin, Jesus is our righteousness, and death, Jesus is our resurrection and the life. Satan's plans have gone wrong, gone awry, and they will continue to go wrong as God's will is accomplished in and through us. As for the devil's future, he will eventually be sent to the place of a torture, hell to the hell, in the lake of burning sulfur. Satan will suffer eternally in the lake of burning sulfur. First, to provide an example of a holy life. Let's read together, please. To provide an example of a holy life. In the context of a suffering for righteousness' sake, Peter tells us that Christ has left us an example that we should follow in his steps. All those who follow Christ ought to conduct themselves, just as Jesus conducted himself. We are to be holy as God is holy. Be holy because I am holy. So let's read together all the three, four, the purpose together. Why did God send Jesus together? First, to reveal the Father. Second, to devolve away the sin. Third, to destroy the works of the devil. First, to provide the example of a holy life. God sent Jesus, his one and only son Jesus, to the world. We praise him for it. We are eternally grateful to our Lord, who at the end of his ministry was able to look to heaven and say, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. On the cross, he said, it is finished, mission accomplished. Praise Jesus, who glorified God's name through his life, ministry, and death. Amen. Can we sing, glorify thy name?
Jesus glorified God, and God said to Jesus, "I have glorified you." By accomplishing this purpose, Jesus could glorify God. Jesus had glorified God through his life, and now he would glorify God through his death. The father was pleased with Jesus' prayer and said, "I have glorified it, and will be glorified again." That's wonderful, isn't it? Jesus glorified God, and God said, "I have glorified it. I'll glorify it again." The father would not abandon the son Jesus to the grave, but he would raise him from the dead and exalt him as the Lord before whom every knee would bow. Through this, he would proclaim his name, the one who has almighty power and glory to all creation. People misunderstood the Father's voice as a thunder and or an angel, but Jesus assured them that it was for their benefit. Then Jesus explained what would happen through his death on the cross. First of all, the prince of this world, the devil, Satan, would be driven out. The devil had a foothold in this world through the sin of mankind and part of death. But Jesus, by his death and resurrection, took away this foothold and crushed Satan's head. In Jesus, we have a victory over Satan. Amen. Can we say it together, please? In Jesus, we have a victory over Satan. Now, devil is like a snake with a crushed head and a flailing tail. Secondly, by being lifted up, Jesus would draw all people to Himself from north and south and east and west. All people to to all people to Himself. Being lifted up refers to Jesus' death, resurrection, exaltation. Through this, Jesus would save people of every tribe, language, and nation. They would come and worship Him, the Lamb of God, seated on the throne. Jesus' death would indeed be a great work. That solves the fundamental problem of all mankind: sin, death, and the Satan. Part two: Jesus invited people to believe in the light. Can we say that together, please? Jesus invited people to believe in the light. Believe in the light together. Believe in the light. The crowd did not like hearing that some men would die, so they spoke up. We have heard from the Lord that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? The concept of the Messiah was tainted by their human desires. They listened to they listened selectively to the Messiah's glory, but ignored his suffering and the death. They had the wrong concept of the Messiah. They ignored this to the suffering and the death. Their own concept would lead them astray from the truth and into destruction, but they did not realize it. Jesus had a great shepherd's heart for them, so he ordered them to walk in the light while they had it before darkness overtook them. Jesus promised that when they believe in the light, they would become children of light. Then they would be able to discern the true Messiah from false concepts of the Messiah. Enjoy the privilege of being God's children. Come out of your spiritual ignorance. You have a wrong concept of the Messiah. Come out of it. And believe in Jesus, who will suffer and die and will be raised again. In verse thirty-seven through forty-three, the author John analyzed the unbelief of the Jewish nation as his conclusion about Jesus' public ministry. People like to say, "If God shows me a sign, I believe in Him." But even after Jesus had shown many signs in their presence, they will they still would not believe in Him. Thirty-seven, they still would not believe in Him. To believe in Jesus is not a matter of evidence, but of a heart of a heart. John was not surprised at their unbelief because it was a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. John quoted Isaiah fifty-three verse one, which introduced. The chapter on the suffering Messiah, because they did not like the suffering, they rejected this biblical Messiah. It seems that their rejection would hinder God's plan, but it did not. John quotes Isaiah chapter six verse ten, which reveals that God knew 
the Accords would be hardened by unbelief. Yet he continued to carry out his plan of salvation. Anyway, God never fails. People's unbelief does not hinder God. It only hurts them. It only hurts them. God's salvation plan was very clear. Jesus, the Messiah, would suffer first suffer and die for our sins. Jesus, the Messiah, would first suffer and die for our sins. That's the biblical concept of the Messiah. He had to die on the cross. Then glory would come through his resurrection and exaltation. The glory that comes through suffering is true glory. Without suffering, there is no glory. No cross, no crown. Can you say that together, please? No suffering, no glory. Together, no suffering, no glory. No cross, no crown. This principle can be applied to every area. For example, a beautiful, heart-moving figure skating performance that is worthy of glory comes through much, much suffering. Like you not can practice, practice more than 10,000 times for one, one act, suffering. The praise and worship team during our conference was amazing, wasn't it? Was inspiring one that is worthy of mention, which comes from much practice, much practice. Without practice, can we have a good <laughs> praise and worship team, inspiring one? No. People do not like suffering because it is painful and it seems futile. But suffering in Christ has great meaning that and it leads us to true glory. So let's suffer for the glory of God. Amen. Let's suffer for the glory of Together, let's suffer for the glory of God. Participate in the sufferings of Christ so we may join in his glory. In verse 42, John gives another reason for the unbelief. A fear of rejection, fear of rejection. Many even among the leaders believed in Jesus silently, but they would not confess their faith because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, a few days ago, daily bread, eh? fear of man will prove, will prove to be a snare. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. To be rejected by people is painful, but to be rejected by Jesus eternally is much more serious. I don't want to be rejected by God. Even if I rejected by people, I don't want to be rejected by God. Verse 43 tells of another reason for the unbelief, loving human praise more than praise from God. Where human beings need respect, honor, and praise. So we are vulnerable to the praise of people. When we love human praise more than praise from God, we lose God's praise and fall into unbelief. Jesus saw people caught by this power of unbelief, and he wanted to save them. So he cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. If you believe in me, you will also believe in God too. Double blessing. Double blessing. Actually, triple blessing. When, when you believe in Jesus, you will believe in God the Father and God the Son, also God the Holy Spirit as well. That's amazing, isn't it? The spiritual blessings. Jesus and the Father got one. Jesus wanted two people to trust in the power and the love of the Father and break out of their unbelief. Come out of your unbelief. Come out of our spiritual ignorance and put your faith in me, Jesus said. Jesus had come into the world to shed the light of God's presence among mankind. In verses 47 through 50, Jesus talks about, about his words. His words enable us to overcome the power of darkness and into his wonderful light. However, anyone who hears his words but does not keep them will be judged by his words. Jesus' words are God's words. Can we say that together, please? Jesus' words are God's words. One more time. Jesus' words are God's words. Those who receive his words will be led to eternal life, while those who reject his words will be led to judgment and condemnation. To accept Jesus' word is not a small matter. It's a matter of eternal life 
and eternal death. Jesus' words are like a kernel of wit, which has life in it. In conclusion, let's read verse 24. I think I, by this time you memorize it eh? together. But truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat puts the crown, puts the crown, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, and um, if it dies, it produces many seeds. But truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat puts the crown and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Such as a seed will never become a plant unless it dies and is buried. So the death and the burial of Jesus was necessary to his glorification. Before there can be a resurrection, power, and the fruitfulness, there must be a death. No death, no resurrection. Together, no death, no resurrection. No cross, no crown. Let's accept Jesus' words about kernel of wit and practice this truth in our lives. Let's not live only for ourselves, but for Christ and his kingdom. Let's die to self and commit to God, live as a kernel of wit which pulls the ground and dies. Then God makes us more fruitful than we can even uh, imagine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Jesus. Praise and thank God for Jesus who taught the principle of accountable wit and the pra uh, put it into practice. But truly I tell you, unless accountable wit falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it, remains, it produces many seeds. Well, thank you for teaching us the essence of the gospel. No death, no resurrection, no cross, no crown. Lord, have mercy on us, O God. Help us not to live as a kind of a wit which remains a single seed. Lord, help us, we may not live only for ourselves, but live for Christ and his kingdom. Lord, help us to die to self and commit to God, live as a kind of a wit which pulls the ground and dies and produces many seeds. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Him, 241, the way of the class leads home. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for today's worship service and this beautiful day you've given us. 
Thank you for your word in John chapter 12, 20 through 50, um, being a seed of wheat. Help us to live sacrificially, Lord, and die to our own self-will, that we may die and bear much fruit for you. Help us to be spiritually rejuvenated and regenerated, Lord, that we can bear a hundredfold and have spiritual life and fruit through your word and spirit, and that we can be grafted into your promise. Thank you for uh, today's message and all the attended here uh, in person and online. We pray that they may be blessed by today's message, that they may grow spiritually and live sacrificially as a kernel of wheat. We pray for today's tithes and offerings that we use for your glory and ministry and outreach. Uh, we pray that we continue to serve you as a church and ministry and in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, now I have testimony of David Johnson. John twelve twenty four to 26 Very truly I tell you unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains only a single seed but if it dies it produces many seeds Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. In these verses, God is calling us to live the crucified life and the life of faith. When we live the life of faith, then our life becomes like a seed sown in the ground. We fulfill our purpose and are glorified by doing what God wants us to do. Jesus' teachings on hatred are controversial. Hating your parents and hating your life do not seem like typical God-fearing attitudes. Jesus says, well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I think that the phrase, in this world, is important. It refers to this present life and the world system. I think Jesus is calling us to stand against worldliness, carnality, and selfishness or self-centeredness. I further think that when Jesus tells us to hate our parents and hate our lives, he is saying, Love God even more than you love your own parents. Love God even more than you love your own life. Loving God is the most important thing. In the life of faith, we can get distracted by the power and gifts of God. We can get distracted by interpreting the world or human nature through a Christian lens. But the most important thing is to love God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-7 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. I think this is talking about Christian unworldliness. We receive comfort directly from God, not from the world, and our sufferings in this world and the violence of hating our lives are consoled by Him. Thus, when we give up worldliness and carnality, we receive a superior comfort. Prayer. Father in heaven, help us to receive your comfort, which is beyond this world. Help us to renounce world and flesh. Help us not to be blinded by self. Help us to embrace Christian suffering that we might also gain Christian hope and patience. Father, help us to live the life of faith. Help us to be like seeds fallen in the ground. In Jesus' name, amen. One decision of faith. Embrace Christian suffering and live a life of faith. Interrupting, but uh, the notion of Jesus teaching hate is a uh, very controversial, difficult one. It is well known that uh, Aramaic uh, and Hebrew and other Semitic languages do not have any word that directly translates into English or Greek word hate. It implies that you continue in your spirit to actively have the feeling of hate and plot against them and so on, you know. There is no such word in Aramaic, okay? It is a mistranslation. The word in Aramaic and in the Semitic languages essentially means cut off, okay? 
And indeed, the, the Hebrew is, is a combination of two uh, ideographs, one meaning, uh, meaning one being a fence and the other being thorns, a thorny fence. That's not the same thing. The thorny fence is put around your sheep to protect them and keep them in, but you don't hate your sheep. You know, you don't necessarily hate, you, you might have bad feelings against being wolves, but you just put up the fence to keep them out. Okay, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's different. Okay? Jesus did not almost, there's no reason to believe that Jesus actively ever taught me. Yeah. I wrote down the application of announcements, Pastor James. Yeah, yeah, thank God for his word. Uh, yeah, thank you, David, for sharing. Thank you, Mr. Merrick. And uh, thank you, Pastor Paul, for sharing. Uh, yeah, very, uh, really, I think very crucial and a timely message that we each need to take to heart today. Um, yeah, when we consider uh, you know, God's love, yeah, what is it that yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he laid down his life for us? And we can see that very vividly you know, through today's passage. So uh, when we think about John 12, 24, let's uh, read that once more, just really uh, take it to heart. Um, yeah, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So, yeah, when we think of, yeah, I mean, I, I think about my own life. If, if I live a, a selfish life, what kind of, you know, what, what value is that? Uh, you know, what, uh, what good comes from that? I can see uh, how much, you know, that, uh, yeah, I really, I do you know, hate that kind of life. Uh, and that, that life that is uh, just for the, the sinful ways. But Jesus is calling us to a whole, whole new life in Him. Um, that He says, just as a seed, uh, just as He will never, uh, will never become plant unless it dies and is buried. So the death and burial of Jesus was necessary for glorification. So we can see that you know in Him, uh, you know in what He did in laying down His life, uh, that we can have a whole new life in Him. And and this is also that we need to deny our sinful. Uh, simple ways, also the, the ways of sin in this world and bring honor to him by living uh, for his ways. So I thank God for, for showing us and teaching us this. Uh, you know, indeed, there can be, you know, as Pastor Paul said, there can be, uh, there can be resurrection power and uh, fruitfulness. Uh, in order to have those, there must be death, as, as what it says here. No death, no resurrection. So Christ, he did need to pay uh, the full cost of our sin on the cross. You know, he truly uh, was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And we too, although it's true that he paid the full price, uh, we are as Christians to, to follow in the way of also denying the sinful ways and uh, uh, our lives as uh, our lives just given over to the selfish things of this world. So no death, no resurrection. Uh, so let's live not for ourselves, but for Christ and his kingdom. I thank God for... Uh, or for Pastor Paul and Michomi, they've been serving the Lord faithfully here, and um, also many, many other missionaries and other other folks here. I thank God for the, the many seeds of faith, and and uh, each each of you are seed uh, that has sprouted you know, through uh, the work of God uh, through them and through through others of, of faith. So I thank God that He is doing uh, that mighty uh, multiplying work, you know, in in here and beyond. Uh, let's really die to self and commit our lives to God and live and also a kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies and produces many seeds. So uh, let's remember these and uh, in the terms of applications, yeah, let's really consider as uh, uh, Professor Mark shared, really what, what do we need in our lives to cut off from you know, that, the, the simple things that are entangling us and that we may uh, live for Christ and holy to him. Uh, so uh, well, let's see. Oh, <laughs> actually, I'm really thankful that uh, we can have the conference and then also this passage because I think it's very uh, closely related uh, that in order to live as moral than conquerors, uh, we need to also deny ourselves and live for Christ and his kingdom. Let's remember what he spoke to us through the conference. Uh, let's thank God for all that he did. Uh, yeah, Pastor Paul shared about the, the, the praise team, and I thank God for that. Let's pray even that we could have a regular praise praise. Uh, time together, uh, you know, maybe not in every week, but we'll see what, as God leads. It does, as Paul mentioned as well, that it does take a lot of work. But I thank God also, 
I was really encouraged uh, to um, hear from Abigail's testimony. She shared, well, that Saturday, you know, we had the uh, time in the afternoon. Actually, Abigail was was uh, really worn out, really, um, she was in bed uh, in, with a sickness. And I, I could hear, I, you know, from the dream I had ahead of time, I knew that God was trying to attack and bring um, to things that would go against us, would come against us, but the devil really hates those things. But, but as Abigail, you know, she was able to come to uh, praise God and she was able to play the piano there. And as she was playing, I was, uh, she said by the third song, all of the sickness that she felt was removed and she could um, be healed. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wanted to share that because I know that through true praise in the Lord, he does amazing things. And he can do amazing things in each of your lives through, through faith and through really worshiping him from our, from our hearts. So let us bring glory to God. Remember uh, you know, what, why we live for him and bring honor to him. So thank God for that. Uh, thank you each for ser who serve very diligently and faithfully through the time. Uh, yeah, I, I really i am so grateful to each of you. May God bless uh, this uh, fellowship in, in Christ. Let's also, uh, let's see, let's pray for Arthur's visit to Milwaukee. It was at, this Friday she'll be coming. Um, so pray for her to uh, be blessed in, in her visit uh, here. And pray for also, yeah, thank God for also, um, uh, oh yeah, well, with that we'll have a lunch uh, this uh, coming week. Also, I've been heard too, some people were talking about a, a cookout today, but we'll see. Um, but, but pray for, for, her, uh, for God's blessing on uh, Peter and Arthur and their their marriage as well, and I pray for also, uh, thank God for the success in the interviews that Peter has had. Uh, pray for each of those as well that are seeking job opportunities and career direction that God would lead. Uh, let's also pray for uh, Hans and Man, I heard, as Greg prayed for, um, for Helen to be in good health. Uh, let's see, any other prayer requests? Okay, well, yeah, based uh, on these things, let's pray. Um, and uh, for that, though, let's have the Lord's Prayer and let's rise. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I pray together, and we'll have refreshments in the back, too.